All right, Mohawk Matt. Mohawk How's it Matt. Going? Where, where, where do you grow up? Where are you from originally? Uh, San Fernando Valley. I'd say like the east side of the San Fernando Valley. Tell me about your uh, your family growing up. You had uh, both your parents. I was adopted. I came from a pretty good, uh, I guess I'd say lower to middle class family working in the San Fernando Valley. I lived in Mission Hills, moved to Sun Valley. How far did you go to school? I was pretty good. I went to private elementary school. I was an altar boy. I did the whole nine yards of doing Catholic elementary and transitioned into the public school system in the junior high area. Your childhood was good. Childhood was pretty good, yeah. I, your I schooling was, was good. Yeah. Tell me about your youth. You were into what kind of stuff? I was into sports. I, I played a lot of baseball, soccer. I was supposed to have played professional baseball, but later on, you'll hear, I chose uh, a night of drugs over... Uh, losing some scholarships in baseball, but I, I found graffiti at a really young age. Graffiti in the San Fernando Valley in the early 90s and late 80s was humongous, and I got fully involved in it as a kid. And that eventually led you to gangs? Eventually, throughout the 90s, if you, uh, the progression in the streets of LA where most of these tagging crews joined gangs, I unfortunately fell into that myself, yeah. You got a couple of tattoos, too. Oh, I've got, I'm completely covered in tattoos. <laughs> I've removed them to put new ones on, removed them again, yeah. Oh. You've you done some prison time? I've done a significant about 19 years in prison. Wow. Yeah. So you're, you're, you had a, a future as, a, as an athlete. Yes. What happened? What, what happened? Well, as, as my growing up, uh, I grew up, as the graffiti moved into street gangs, I, uh, one of my best, best of friends back when I was younger, Chubbs, convinced me one night after not trying any drugs at all. I'm talking, I didn't smoke marijuana, never had a, <laughs> never had a beer, excuse me, never tried even a cigarette. I tried crack cocaine one night out of the blue at 21 years of age. It was an immediate, within one year's time, I lost every single freaking thing I owned. I lost my scholarships. I lost every chance. My, my college was blown. Crack cocaine just took me for a whirlwind. Hmm. How long did that last? It lasted a few years. And I had, in order to get off of crack cocaine, I made the wise choice of injecting crystal meth. And that, that's a whole other ballgame. <laughs> yeah, crystal meth can do that. But I was able, unfortunately, I don't know what's going on around here, but I was able to do real crystal meth and real amphetamine uh, speed. Nowadays, there's so much stuff in these drugs that you don't know what you're getting from one hour to the next. So you're not Mexican, you're not black. You're, you're... No, I'm, I'm a white boy. I grew up with Mexicans. I, that's part of my story and I always make sure it's known. I, I'm one of those white boys, one of four in the neighborhood of all Mexicans that grew up with them. And I love them just like myself. What kind of gangs were you in? I was from a street gang that was predominantly Mexican. It wasn't technically Mexican at the time. I mean, it wasn't technically like, I guess you'd say Southsider at the time, but it evolved into that over the years. Hmm. Yeah. And then in prison? When I went to prison, I made the extremely smart choice for myself, but unwise on a gang aspect choice to stay with my own race. And that caused a lot of turmoil in my neighborhood at home as they progressed into the more south side angle of a gang and I stayed with my race. Um, so, the, so the gang story in, in prison is very different than on the streets. A lot of people don't understand that, but just because you're from a street gang doesn't always necessarily mean you're gonna be involved in that clique in prison. I'm white, and I didn't know my ass from a hole in the wall. When I went to the county jail in the 90s, I remember one white guy asking me one question that sticks with me to this day. He said, what race are you? And I said, I'm white. Well, then that's where my journey began. I went that way. I had no idea what was going on when you go to the county jail. And if you know anything about the county jail in the early 90s, it was a very scary and a very dangerous place to be. And you were in prison for what? Uh, numerous things. My first time was, I think, uh, criminal threats and some uh, shoplifting, uh, assault assault and battery. My last term was two counts of criminal threats, felony vandalism, a kidnapping, and home invasion. Hmm. Yeah. But you straightened out your life. Yeah, when I got out of prison, I had to beat a drug addiction pretty gnarly. It took me a while getting out of prison. I paroled in 2013. I want to say about, about for about five years, I was lost. I was strung out on drugs in my mom's house, destroyed my mother's million-dollar home that she moved to from the valley to Santa Clarita. I mean, I destroyed, I gutted a million-dollar home in the process of trying to, trying to get myself back to normal. Because I came home from prison, unlike the military, with way more PTSD than I ever did in the military. What kind of stuff did you see in prison? I am one of those dudes that doesn't like to talk too much about prison. I, I'll tell, I tell some stories, a couple things that I've gone through. Um, one of the worst things I can honestly say, and I don't think I've, admit, I've admitted this on camera, but I saw a kid's head get cut off. I saw two inmates, due to a racial situation, attack this one kid repeatedly over and over until his head fell off. And it was right in front of me. And in prison, if you know, when they hit those alarms, you're, you have to lay down on the ground. And I'm proned out on the ground in a yard 20 feet from me. These two skinheads are attacking this other inmate because he chose the wrong racial affiliation. And I can still, when I close my eyes, see the, you can see it. Like, this is stuff you can never unsee. I don't care who you are, what you've been through. When you go to some of these places in prisons, it's extremely scary. 
If you're the toughest of the tough, I tell you, you're full of shit. Because these places make every grown gangster scared. And I remember these two inmates just stabbing this kid so many times, his head finally fell off, and they kick his head. And when, when someone dies, especially when there's that much blood loss, there's so much blood that these kids were slipping in the blood. They were covered in blood. The blood starts to coagulate and get hard. Mind you, the cops have not responded because they're horrified at what they saw also. Cops are known for getting stuck, frozen in fear too. That this, went, this scene went on for about 20 minutes until finally the kids stopped, threw the knives down, and they sat there and they said, come on. I'll never forget the look. I can close my eyes and see it. The one kid sat there and said, come get me. I'm done. Mind you, he had already kicked this kid's head rolling down the pathway in the dirt. And he's covered in blood. And he sits down and he had the, the audacity of you to sit there and look at the cop and say, come arrest me. I'm done. And the, to know that I just watched cops watch you do this and not react on it also was amazing. The tower lady was a female officer in the tower. She had the M1 and she didn't shoot because she's frozen with fear also. People don't understand that these acts, when you see them with the human eyes, they're, they're, they're startling. They freeze you. And, and I was, me, me laying down was scared too. And mind you, this is a situation that now took 24 hours of our day because, <laughs> excuse me, this situation now turns into a crime scene. Local police out in the Calipatria area of, of uh, Imperial up by uh, San Bernardino Pass there, they bring cops in. This is now a crime scene. You can't move. You're stuck on the yard where they're bringing you water and a sandwich because you can't move either. It turns into a crime scene. It was just, it, that's one of probably about five stories I have like that that just sometimes I can't unsee at night. It's a lot to deal with. It is, yeah. Were you, were you ever living on the streets? To me, I have to be honest with you. To me, living on the streets was me and my, my, my SUV Lincoln parked in my mom's driveway. <laughs> she kicked me out, and I, but, but kicked out to me was living in the driveway in a Lincoln SUV. You know, I had to beg to shower. My drug use took me to some really... I would say my drug use took me to worse places for my family than on the streets, like, like some other people. What, what do you make of that whole lifestyle? Gangs and drugs and all that? Uh, I think they're intertwined, yet at the same time, they're not. They're intertwined, but they're not. I say that strongly because I remember being from a gang. If I did anything, smoking crack was horrified. You had to hide in shame. If you injected meth, heroin, fentanyl, you had to hide in shame. It wasn't something the homies were okay with let alone the behavior you see outside here and everywhere else around you building in America, this open drug use that you see, like in the day, my people would have, you probably would have got beat up for that. You can't do that in front of women and children. Uh, uh, just regular women going to work, that's just not tolerated. And I, I feel that it's, it's gotten to a scary place. A scary place. How'd you finally get clean? May 18th, 2018, I finally got clean. How'd you do it? Well, uh... This is the best part of my story I've repeated. Um, for about two weeks, I was laying in my mom's house in the spare room in the dark, watching pornography, uh, trying to pretend that I look sexy and I weigh 80 pounds, sweaty. Mind you, I've been going, I've started to go bald, so I'm growing my hair and I look like, I look like a monster. My hair's not shaven, I'm not shaven, I'm sweaty. I'm wearing a wife beater that's four sizes too big, it's size extra large, and it's hanging off me. Um, I've been doing meth and heroin back and forth. I remember the last day, like it was yesterday. I mean, I did 17 shots of meth and heroin all over my body. The last injection I think I did, I just told this was in the vein in my penis. And I shot this dope in my, I mean, in my penis. And it didn't work. Nothing's working. And I, and I had been begging God. I believe in Jesus. I also believe in Odin because I am Viking in culture. I've been praying to both of them. God, uh, uh, remove this. Take this from me. Please take this away from me. I can't handle it. I'm ready to stop, but I don't know how. And I had been praying, <laughs> excuse me, night after night for this to stop. And this last day, it wasn't working. And I finally, after about 17 shots of meth or heroin that weren't getting me high, and I'm not missing the vein either, I remember just putting the needle down and being like, oh my God, my prayers have been answered. They've been answered. I'm not smart enough to deal with it. And I remember I knocked on my door and I opened the door and I called my mom's name. I said, mom, I'm ready. Please get me out of here. What do I got to do? What do I got to do? I tell people this, you can't get sober for your neighbor, for your mom. You can't even do it for your kids. You have to be at a place where you are spiritually and mentally broke. When you are at that bottom looking up, that's, <laughs> that's probably the only time you're going to realize it's time to change. And I was willing to do anything. If you told me to mop your toilet out 17 times a day, give me the mop. Whatever you said for me to do, Mark, whatever you needed me to do at that moment, I would have done it just to stay off those drugs and away from them because I was done. It's the hardest thing you've ever done. I've been to prison, a level four yard. I've been in the U.S. Navy as a fireman. I have been in street gangs. I've been shot at, shot, stabbed, jumped. Yes, that was a, definitely the hardest thing. I'd rather fight six Crips again before I, before I have to uh, get sober. It was, yeah. it was the heroin that was the hardest part? No. Funny enough, I tell people this a lot. I got off of heroin extremely easier than I got off of that meth. Meth kicked my ass. I had 
the same symptoms coming off that meth as, as people I hear do, do on heroin. Yeah. Really? Yep. What do you what do you think of the whole culture now of, of what's what's going on in LA? I, you know, the gangs, the homeless, the whole thing. Drugs. Gangs I've noticed are starting to re full circle, they're starting to come back. I'm watching the news a lot lately and I notice gangs are coming back, which is scary because in the nineties when I grew up, gangs were way different, way more active, way more violent. And it looks like it's going back to that. The drug culture, I'm a, I mean, I'm an addict myself, and I say this as lightly as I can. I'm not okay with them being allowed to do drugs everywhere on the streets. You're setting the wrong message. The cops, I'm not against the cops. I'm also not for them. I try to stay out of their way so they can do their job. Um, but a few weeks ago, I was watching, I was down here watching as they, they pulled up and watched a, a naked woman inject heroin and then drove off when she was done. And I'm like, I just, I'm, I'm scared for LA. I'm from LA. I'm from the Valley, but we're still LA. And I'm just scared to watch what's unvol- evolving around us. There's no consequences for it. And it seems like it's getting worse and it's getting worse. Can't take my girlfriend and her kids to walk in some parks because they've taken over the parks. And I feel that there's a definite difference in like mental health. You talked about this on your show. There's a difference in homelessness, mental health, and drug addiction. And a lot of the times I feel that we're missing out in helping some people realizing that you're just helping someone get high and they don't need help getting high. I walk people all the time. If anybody asks me for food, okay, let's go to the liquor store. I'll get you some chips. I'll get you a soda. I'm not giving you money. I'm not buying you cigarettes or alcohol either. If you're hungry, cool. But I'm not going to hand anybody cash. I think nine times out of ten. Nine times out of ten, they you, you know what they'll say? I'm cool then. Thanks. No, but okay. nine times out of ten when you're giving an addict money here. When nine times out of ten when you're giving an addict money, it is not going to food. It is going to drugs, cigarettes, or alcohol. Yeah. Your life is better now. My life's amazing now. I work for a great, I work for the biggest tattoo clothing company in the world. I, I, I've been traveling the world going to conventions with this company. I model. I would have never thought my junkie ass would be modeling. You know what I mean? Especially at my age, too. Yeah. Do you have kids or your girlfriend? I have a son who's 23. He doesn't talk to me much. I, uh, I have to deal with the fact that when I went to prison, I, uh, I had every, his mother gave me every chance and I didn't pay attention to it. And uh, I went to prison and signed away my rights. I thought it was the best choice because my plan in going to prison was to get as actively involved in the politics and the gangs as I could and to not come home and make a name for myself. But when I finally came home, I realized that was a mistake and I'm, my son talks to me here and there. He kind of just messages me because he wants free clothing, but he doesn't want to have a relationship with me really and I have to respect it. What's your biggest fear? My biggest fear? Sometimes I feel like with my son, I, my biggest fear is like I don't get to tell you. I, I just wanted him to hear why I did what I did. I want my son to know that like, I didn't walk away from you. I just, I made the best decision for you. I thought at the time I was involved in gangs and drugs. And the reason I walked away from you was because I didn't think I was coming home and I thought he deserved a better shot at a life without me. In hindsight, you realize, wow, I changed my life. Damn, he had a better shot with me. And now I might've lost that shot. Other than that, my biggest fear is probably losing my mom. She's my best friend, Hmm. total best friend. Sorry about that. Yeah. What advice do you give to young men that are thinking of joining a gang or women don't if i could go back to when my tag and crew joined i remember i remember this night when we had a meeting we had a meeting and i i was probably one of three of us that didn't want to do it and we just did it out of some sense of not wanting to be looked down on we didn't want to be looked at as weak but i if i could do it again i would i would do it again no disrespect to my homeboys because i still love my homeboys in my neighborhood in sun valley but that choice whether it be racially or whether it be just and a broader choice, it was bad. I was into graffiti and artwork and stuff like that. I wasn't really, the gang thing wasn't me. I adapted to it well, but yet at the same time, it's not really me. I was more into art and music. And I mean, I was a gothic, picture this, a gothic punk rock cholo who plays first base baseball. Listening to gothic punk rock music, Depeche Mode. I'm riding around on a skateboard, graffiti, and, and trying to gangbang. It was a cluster fuck, <laughs> but I did it. Your dad was not in your life? My dad is in my life. That's the thing. I let him down, too. My dad's a uh, retired Air Force uh, vet in Vietnam. He just looks at me like, I've done my best to make amends, but the amends are still not good enough for him. The tattoos have got a... Oh, my God. He won't even go somewhere. I was telling my girlfriend this yesterday. He won't even go to the movies with me unless I'm wearing a hoodie and a hat on top of the hoodie or under the hoodie. He will not go out with me in public, especially because I have the fuck the sheriff's department tattoo right here. For a, I got into a fist fight with a couple of them off-duty in Santa Clarita. So I put this on the side of my head to commemorate that. And that alone, he won't even be seen in public with me. You have a tattoo that says what? Fuck the sheriff's department. <laughs> I got into a fist fight with a couple of them off duty because they, they thought they could pick up on my girlfriend because they're sheriffs. They actually told me this 
well, we're sheriffs. We can do what we want. I said, okay, well, that's my girlfriend. We ended up in the, in the parking lot in a fist fight. And I, I mean, I got with one of them, but, the, but they, they kind of got me after that. Do you regret the tattoos? You know, some of them I do. I've removed a lot of them. I've removed a lot of stupid, hateful gang tattoos that I had all over me. And I've since replaced them with cool stuff. I regret some of, the t- some of them that I've got. Yes, definitely. The memories I made with them, I don't because they're stuff I've had to go through and grow through. But some of them that I was dumb enough to put on my body, yeah, I definitely regret them. I definitely do. Those are like things you did in prison and stuff? Gangs, hateful nonsense. All that gang stuff is... It's part of my history, but it's not where I'm at now. And, and where I'm at now wants to scream at that kid that I was to tell him, don't, don't fucking do that. Don't wait on that tattoo for a month. Just sit on it for a month. You know? But I wish I could talk to my younger self. If you had your life to live all over again, what, what, what would you have done differently? Uh, this is a bad question because I just told this to my homeboy Lonely who did 29 years. He got out and someone asked him this. I want to say that I would do so much different, but at the same time, if I did that, then I wouldn't be who I am right now. It's true. If I didn't go through all of that, I couldn't be helping as many people. Right now, I'm sponsoring guys in recovery from here to, New, uh, to Great Britain. I've got guys using Instagram and social media is amazing for me to help people in recovery. But if I wasn't, or didn't go through that, I, I couldn't do what I'm doing now. I would have no, if I just got the job and, and sold cars or went to school to be a lawyer, I probably would have been a great lawyer, but I wouldn't be able to touch as many people I believe as I touch now. No. What's your biggest regret? Not finishing college, not, not staying in, in my, my, my son's life, I think. But I have a second chance. I got a girlfriend with, with two kids that are amazing little kids, and right now I'm getting a second chance by proxy to, to relive that. Are you happier now than you've ever been? I can say, yeah, I'm happier now than I've ever been, yeah. yeah. Yeah, where I'm at with my girlfriend, with my parents, with my mother, with my company, totally, I'm totally happier, happier now than I've ever been, yeah. How old are you? I'm 45, I'm about to be 46 in April. Matt, what would, you, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Most important lesson, I would say follow your heart. Your brain, your dick might necessarily lead you wrong. But your heart usually will lead you down the right way. And even if you make a mistake following your heart, it's something you can probably easily fix. But if you listen to your brain sometimes, I think, or your dick, you're probably going to make a bad decision. Yeah. That's great. All right, Matt. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Good luck with everything. Thank you.